Anybody else? 25. I was going to say someplace low like that. Um, the number, tra the number traditionally, uh, and meaning that we were that we were taught within the last couple of years is between five and ten percent. Again, a very surprising number, I think, um, between five and ten percent. Now we have 300 DNA exonerations by the project in New York alone, or not quite 300, just under 300. I think it's 287 or something like that um, by that project. This that's just DNA cases. And DNA is present in only five to ten percent of serious felony cases. What does that tell us about the number of people in prison who are, you know, the, the numbers-wise, are very likely, very likely innocent? Okay, we're missing about ninety percent of the of innocent people. Exactly, and I'll talk more about that in uh, in just a moment. There have been over two hundred. Okay, so uh, as I said, I think the number is two eighty-seven. DNA exonerations, just DNA alone by the project in New York alone. Um, at the same time, over 250 death row exonerations in this country. Again, you know, a plane and a half full of people. You know, a lot, it's a lot of people. Um, in Illinois, um, <laughs> you know, we're number two. You know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're proud to be number two or something like that. Um, we've had um, approximately 20 people who were, when there was a death row, who were exonerated from death row as innocent. 20 people. Now, compare that to 12 people who the state of Illinois executed between 1977 when the death penalty was reinstated and when, the, when Mr. Cocorales was executed in about 2000. Um, 12 executed, 20 innocent. Not so good. Um, the, uh, the, the numbers of uh, exonerations in this state place us actually, actually third in the nation behind, want to guess who's first? In wrongful convictions, Texas is, Texas is one. Guess who's two? Uh, Las, Nevada. Houston County, Texas is two. Oh. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And Illinois is three. Yes. Sure. I watched a documentary on PBS mm -hmm. about a man whose house caught on fire on oh. like Christmas Day. Do you know? Who yeah, Todd about? Willingham. Yeah. Todd Willingham. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, what happens in that case? Is it just done, and we can never know the truth, or is does the Innocence Project work on those cases, or? It's very difficult. Um, the resources are limited, and there are people. I mean, you know, there are people who. You know, we and the other innocence projects are, are who are trying to get out, and so to devote. Uh, you know, I wish there was time and resources to devote to any case where the execution was questionable. And there actually has been. There's been a lot. If you, again, if you go on uh, YouTube and you look at, um, you know, look at some of the programs that were done. Uh, some of the some of the mainstream um, folks on you know on, on some of the major networks have done some good programs on uh, on on that case. So I would urge you to look at that. So a lot has come out, but again, it, it's Texas. Right, um, right. So what, what's really gonna be done? Not much. Remember, um, the governor, the current governor of that state had appointed a board, and the board was to examine that particular case. And the board was ready to issue a report, and the report was going to, as it's been reported, the report was going to say, you got problems with innocence in this case. This man was executed, and there's real questions. And on the eve of the report being issued, he changed the board. He changed the, board? He changed the membership of the board. And guess what the report said later? So you get the idea. Um, so, you know, and there's one other factor in this state that cannot be overlooked. And that is the, the role that the Chicago Police Department has played in wrongful convictions of people there. And we call it, um, we call it torture. Um, there were, by uh, my understanding, I was just at, a pre just at a presentation on this by one of the lawyers who's really just one of my heroes, just a great guy um, who's, who's been fighting these cases for a long, long time and a lot of other police brutality cases, a guy named Flint Taylor. 
And Flint Taylor told us that um, the reliable numbers are that a minimum of 110 uh, people were, uh, all African American males, were tortured uh, in uh, Chicago uh, by, by the uh, police department there, police officers there. Um, and where it all began, according to what Mr. Taylor told us, was that the commander of that unit, a man named John Burge, who you've all read about probably in, in the press, John Burge um, was in Vietnam. And in Vietnam, uh, he was unfortunately in charge of, uh, his, his, his station was, his duty was to, uh, to guard a, a military prison where they kept POWs. And part of the um, procedure that John Burge learned there was how to torture POWs to get evidence, so-called evidence. You know, we lawyers say, you know, if a statement is not voluntary, it's not reliable. So, you know, if you're torturing people to get, you know, to get so-called evidence, you know, you got reliability problems, let alone human rights types of, type of problems. And John Burge, as I said, uh, learned to do this in Vietnam. And then he became a Chicago police officer. And then he, then he was given charge of an area, that's what they call their police districts, an area. Um, he was given charge of an area, and it started there. So are we surprised? <laughs> no, not, not in the slightest. Uh, it's a huge problem, but frankly, those of us who think that the death penalty is a, is a horrible human rights abuse um, have the Chicago Police Department to thank, in part, for helping to get rid of it because of what they did. Uh, it played a huge role. Uh, again, the press brought all this stuff out, and the investigations were, were uh, very, very helpful in persuading the legislature uh, to, uh, to uh, abolish, abolish the death penalty. Um, <clears throat> you know, we talked just um, a little bit about um, those who were in history who were wrongfully convicted. And I would submit that there is one common factor that applies to almost all of those cases just about all those cases. And what do you think that is? Race, Race in a lot of cases. Oh, fear. Yeah. Absolutely fear. Puritans. Yeah. Witches. Right? Mm -hmm. how, did, how did we treat African Americans in this country after the Civil War? Were they, were they welcomed by, by most aspects of society? Of course not. Why? We're afraid of them taking over or rising up to a point of equality or, or what have you. Yeah, sure. How about McCarthyism? What was that based on? Fear. Communism. Fear of communism. Patriotism. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and go through all the different examples. How about her? We see that right now with socialism. Absolutely, no the question. The media is making socialism out yes. to be the new big bad communism. Right, Whatever well. Socialism is actually good. <laughs> Capitalism is what we're trying to avoid. <laughs> and, you know, and our media has done, uh, our media has, um, re as our media has reported, um, you know, the attack on the, on, I'm validating your point, the attack on the president. He's a socialist. That's what the other side wants to, you know, wants to uh, hammer him with. So, um, you know, how about, and look, again at, look again at Hurricane Carter. Let's talk about his case. Yeah. What was the, what, why did that happen? And in what period of time? Civil rights movement. Civil rights movement. What happened to those in the civil rights movement in the 60s? Oh, they were killed. Arrested. Right? Arrested. That's exactly right. Rejected in all kinds of fashions. I can't remember the woman's name, but there was a woman from, well, she was a mother of two from New Jersey that went on the Bio Freedom Right. What's her name? Bio uh, yes, that's it. I could, uh, yeah. and she was killed down right. there. And right. I can remember people saying she deserved it because she shouldn't have been there. She wasn't killed. It was her husband or something. No, she, no, she was, was killed. killed. I thought she was the one that called the president and asked mm -hmm. for help. And no, 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 she no. was oh, killed. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. she was killed along with two other, two one other black and one white, wasn't it? I, I thought think. it was two young black men. Yeah, yeah. was it two young? <clears throat> black men? You know. Yeah. No, quote, no doubt about it. So there's been assassinations as well. Sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. And again, the common factor is fear. And let's focus for just a second on our 
um, system of incarceration in this country and what what is driving the bus there we have in this country over two million two million of our citizens locked up two million plus of our citizens locked up and the number is going like this um, we have about seven and a half million of our citizens either locked up on probation on parole or somehow involved in the criminal justice system I think we'd probably lock up more than two million if there were more spaces to do that but that's a big problem right now why has this happened why has this happened I don't know but if they keep privatizing it's going to get worse yeah well that you know it's all about money there we know but the question is why has this happened why do we incarcerate both in terms of raw number and in terms of per capita, why do we incarcerate more than anybody in the world? Control. Control. Keeping marginalized populations marginalized and not allowing them to attain equal economic or political yes. power. Yeah. Yeah. And, fear. and fear. Yeah. That's Is right. Anything we that's not in? like you. Well, that's right, because, because we know that a hugely disproportionate people are poor and African American or Latin, um, just disproportionate in huge numbers to the population. But that's how we got <coughs> our drug laws. Sure. sure. Marijuana was to get rid of the Mexicans. Right. Cocaine was to right. get rid of the yeah. Chinese. I mean, you could buy heroin up until 90, 1937 in bottles over the counter. Uh, it was in 1937 that. Yes, <laughs> that became a law. Huh. Which drugstore was that? <laughs> Any of them in Chicago. Bear heroin. Look it up on the uh, internet. You true. can see it. It was for the common cold. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. We thought it was a great way to people off that nasty morphine and stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was <clears> so, <throat> and that was used to control the Chinese sure. culture at the sure. time. And it was fear of the Chinese. Right. That is going to point out that in, I think in predominantly southern states, uh, there's voter disenfranchisement. Absolutely. Because for, we're afraid of what if you're votes a, might be cast. Yeah. If, you're a, if, you, if you are a, if you have been convicted of a felony, notably Florida, they had the big scandal because of the uh, people being sent letters that, that said that uh, the they had been convicted of a felony when they weren't or, or some, right, some right. such thing. Sure. Well, that is not dissipating. That was, we know, that's only getting worse mm -hmm. um, across the country right now. Um, you know, just a couple points for, for me to wrap up. And, you know, and again, we have what we call the war on crime. Mm -hmm. When did that war on crime start? What was that? What, what was that contiguous to? What did that spring out of? Civil rights. Civil rights. Civil rights. Mm -hmm. It started at, at, as a result of and at the end of roughly the civil rights movement. War on crime. And now we have all these people in prison. And it's a shame. And by the way, <coughs> a pro <coughs> excuse me, approximately 50, I think it's 55% of the federal prison population and 45% of the states, 50 states prison population are incarcerated for drug offenses. You know, we, we think of violent crimes and people being locked up for violent crimes, which, you know, as a parent and a citizen, uh, that's, that's, that's what we got. You know, that's okay, we need to protect uh, our society. <clears throat> but drug offenses? So that's, that, really, that really says something. There are a lot of reasons why, you know, I could go through a whole litany of things. I teach this class, it's a whole semester's worth of, things about, like I said, bad eyewitness identification uh, procedures and results, obviously false confessions, thanks to interrogation techniques that, um, that are used, you know, hello, Chicago Police Department with, uh, with torture, the use of um, CSs, confidential sources, jailhouse snitches, um, that sort of thing, police and prosecutor misconduct, bad defense lawyers, juror misconduct, um, and a whole, yeah, plea bargaining. We're going to give you the death penalty if you don't plead guilty, yeah. So there's a lot of reasons why it occurs. I think it all comes back to fear. I think that's what our system, mm -hmm. to a large degree, is based on. Hey, we can even take it another step. What happened after 9-11? Uh, How did we treat 
How did, well, that's right. We had war, wars, plural, exactly. And how did we treat um, Muslim Americans in this country? Not even the Japanese. Right, yeah, exactly. Not even anybody with brown skin, <clears throat> right. even moderately looked. Right. Yeah, and, and horribly. We're, we're, we seem to be afraid of due process. Uh, well, we yes, the Patriot, Act. the Patriot Act. Right, and somebody mentioned the internment of, of Japanese American citizens yes. in order to, uh, obviously, out of, out of fear. So. Yeah, currently, uh, something going through uh, D.C. that basically declares the U.S. a battleground, and so anybody suspected of being a terrorist can be held without reason for indefinite amounts of time. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. And this is <laughs> funny how this seems to be happening, too, around the time that the Occupy movement is gaining ground. Yeah, and that, yeah. yeah I, I, I consider it a matter of not of if, but when those kinds of laws are used against the Occupy movement, and it will be out of fear that somehow we're Absolutely. going to be some, I don't know, revolutionary movement yeah. in the traditional sense. Right. No. Oh. I, th I think that if we go back a ways, that every time there's been an upsurge in people's resistance to the status quo, it's been accompanied by a crime wave, you know, war on crime. Yes, yes. You know, going back to the Mitchell, you know, the Palmer raids in mm -hmm. the 19 whatever's 19. 1919, and you know, going back before that in the 1880s. I was thinking about the civil rights period when drug when drug use, of, particularly among black activists, you can. I mean, there's been a couple of cases where, where civil rights activists were caught with less than a joint and received 99-year prison yeah, sentences. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, so I think that there's, you know, I'm not denying that there's fear, but I think that there's also a very definite political context to it in terms of trying to tamp down struggle against the status quo. Well, preying on fear. There was the guy who got who the politicians. Died. Praying, praying on, on those fear. who are fearing. P-R-E-Y. P-R-E-Y, yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay. Correct. I was trying to figure that one. Like the, <laughs> remember the pizza case in California? Where the, sure. the guy was, Remember it was his fourth felony conviction. Yes. And he got a well life sentence life. That's, that's exactly <clears throat> for right. stealing pizza. Yeah, yeah. You know, one just wrap up thought, and then I, I can stay for about, I can stay for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just uh, somebody's calling my girlfriend now to give her, <laughs> give her my, give her my excuse, my note. Um, you know, tell me, you know, with with over um, two million people locked up, the problem is, and this is the lawyer now and me talking. The problem is that our system places a huge. Um, amount of reliance and finality on the verdict of a jury. And the verdict of a jury is not always right. We DNA, the beauty of DNA is that it proves that. The jury believes the false confession. The jury believes the bad eyewitnesses. The jury believes the jailhouse snitch or you know the juror engages in their own misconduct, whatever. DNA, thank goodness, has proven a lot of those cases um, to be wrongful you know, conviction of innocent people. Um, you know, there's a study that says, and this is just one study, this is just one study. There's a study, and I ran across this, this is really One in eight jury verdicts may be wrong. One in eight. Now, let's, you know, that's what, uh, 12 and a half, 13, 14 percent, whatever. Um, <clears throat> Let's say, let's cut that number way down. Let's say it's 2% or 3%. 2% of a uh, prison population of over 2 million people means 40,000 people in prison who are innocent. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Um, and that, I think, is a very, very conservative, um, understated, understated number. And, you know, one other factor about this, you know, be, and, and people... People, you know, they say, oh, how do you know there's all these, you know, we have this system and it's set up and you know, who else is going to decide, who else is going to decide guilt and innocence other than jurors and with a judge sitting, sitting there, you know, leading the show and all this stuff, how else are we going to do it? <coughs> and I'm not sure how else we do it. The question is that the system has to allow for the correction of mistakes by allowing access to DNA, but to the biological evidence after the fact, by allowing people to have hearings they don't always get a hearing by allowing them to have resources, a lawyer, 
to assist them in drafting the pleadings that they have to that they have to draft. Because you know, when we think about what's the prevalence of this, and I'm always asked that question: oh, How many people do you think it is? And as I said, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I was interested to find that study, um, that that one out of eight jury verdict study. I thought that was really interesting. But that's just one study. Um, but all I can tell you is this: Tell me one aspect of our society, one discipline, one profession in our society that doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> George Bush. Prosecuting attorneys. Yeah, okay. Well, and again, any, yeah. anybody here ever been through the medical system in this country? We find mistakes there every day. Anybody get your car fixed? How often they get that right every time? Not so much. How about you go to order a sandwich in a restaurant? Something simple like that. You know, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not right. Every aspect of our society, including lawyers, makes mistakes. And the, the problem is, every time I hear um, someone who's involved with a, with a case say, well, I can't wait to hear, the, uh, you know, or can't wait to, uh, to the time when a jury gets the case, because then we'll know what happened. No, we won't. We will know what the jury said happened, but we won't necessarily know what actually happened. The system has to allow that the jury can be mistaken. There's a famous case out of um, southern Illinois not that long ago, probably, uh, 20 years ago, where a man was on trial for his life. It was a murder case. And, um, you know, and, and I, don't think it, I don't think there was a question about innocence in this case, but the propriety of the process was really challenged when it was discovered by a bailiff who walked into a room like this, walked into a jury room. A bailiff walked in and he found um, in the in the uh, garbage can, he found some photocopies of a uh, of a of a piece of paper that had something on it, and he looked at it, and it was the and the man on trial was African American male, um, and it was twelve copies of a so called so called joke about African Americans, a very, very distasteful joke. In fact, it was so distasteful, the Illinois Supreme Court, to their credit, wouldn't even say what it was in the opinion, thank goodness. And so they immediately reversed the case and sent it back. So our system is always right because we get a jury to tell us what happened? I don't think so. Every aspect of our society makes mistakes. The good news is science, um, <laughs> I gotta be careful when I, how I say this because um, science helps in the form of DNA. Do you know that the only, you know, anybody here ever heard of CSI, the <laughs> television show? Oh, okay. Yeah. Some of that stuff actually exists and most of it doesn't, so. Um, <clears throat> but fortunately, um, the, you know, the only um, evidence, the only forensic evidence that was actually invented or created by, or apply, I should say applied by um, you know, by scientists is DNA. Everything else comes from law enforcement. Everything else. Whether you're talking about fingerprints or voice stress uh, analyzers or, you know, uh, interrogation techniques, obviously, all other kinds of evidence, you know, lineups. Um, it was not until the 1930s when the U.S. Supreme Court said, you know, we don't think we should be admitting um, confessions where it into evidence where the person has been beaten to a pulp and then confessed. That they were still being admitted until then. And that's when um, police said, okay, we need to come up with some other, other ways of doing things. And certain uh, for, forensic techniques uh, came forward. Certain interrogation methods were, um, were invented and have been utilized ever since. And the, the idea was to coerce instead of beat, uh, because the Supreme Court had required that. So is that when waterboarding came about? I don't, I'm not sure when waterboarding came about, but I, you know, I think that would still be put in the category of physical, uh, physical coercion. Um, or Chicago phone book treatment. Or typewriter covers or anything along those lines that they used up there, uh, or electric shocks to, to the body. So. Um,